What's up everyone? Today we're taking a look at the American Revolution. We finally are becoming the USA and we're going to help you out with all of your history needs. So remember in April of 1775 the shots are fired at Lexington and Concord and a little bit later you have the Second Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia in May of 1775. And really the colonies are really working together. Remember there's been this movement towards intercolonial unity but keep in mind there still is no clear consensus for independence. There was division amongst the colonists as to whether or not to declare independence. This was still a radical idea and most people at this point want to try to negotiate. At the same time they're trying to negotiate though, they are organizing the Continental Army and they pick Mr. Jorge Washington as their commander-in-chief and even while they're negotiating, more battles take place. You have Bunker Hill in June of 1775, the British take the hill, they take it from the colonists, but the colonists hold their own and this really builds the confidence of the colonial cause, like we can hold our own against the most powerful military in the world. At the same time, the colonists sought peace by sending the Olive Branch petition to King George III. They pledged their loyalty, they said they want to work with Parliament, they see themselves as British, and they're really trying to negotiate and try to prevent a larger war from occurring. Now, if you're wondering why they're doing this, remember loyalty is deeply ingrained in the colonists. They believe they're part of the British Empire. They see themselves as British. Colonial unity was poor for a very long time, So, and rebellion was dangerous. Now, King George III, though, dismisses the Olive Branch petition and declared the colonies in rebellion. He also hires some German mercenaries to handle the situation. And it is important to note that in 1775, as the fights at Bunker Hill and Lexington and Concord have taken place, there's still no clear consensus for independence amongst members of the Continental Congress. Deeper roots of the American Revolution, even before these fights started taking place. And you really have to kind of understand the ideas of the Enlightenment from the 18th and 17th century. Ideas of people like John Locke and Rousseau were strongly influencing colonial thought. And Enlightenment ideas emphasize the individual over hereditary privilege. There was an emphasis on reason and science, and you can really see this in the writings of John Locke. He said, Locke said, everyone has natural rights and the power of government is derived from popular consent. And these ideas were coming over to North America and really influencing colonial society. And you see the Enlightenment ideas very much represented in Thomas Paine's pamphlet, Common Sense, which is published in January of 1776, and it makes the most clear, persuasive argument for independence to date. And what he says, a very radical idea at the time, is he calls for the creation of a republic, a representative government, based on natural rights of the people, based upon consent. He said the colonies should break away from England. He talks about a large continent cannot be run by an island, by England. Paine's ideas are heavily influenced by the Enlightenment. He breaks them down in very simple language and he says people could rebel against a government when it didn't protect their rights. And that's exactly what he's calling for and these ideas spread throughout the colonies. You get the final push for independence when Richard Henry Lee of Virginia issues a resolution saying the colonies should declare independence. Thomas Jefferson drafted the formal Declaration of Independence and it has a couple of goals. One, you want to justify independence by listing the grievances against King George III. And you can see this if you read the Declaration of Independence. There's a whole bunch of them. There was one that was taken out. Jefferson wrote against slavery, ironically enough, um, blamed the king and parliament for that, and that was removed at the assistance of Southerners. Another goal of the Declaration of Independence is to rally support amongst the colonists. Remember, not everyone favored independence. This was still a radical idea to be pursuing. They also want to get assistance from foreign nations. They want to rally them to the cause of the colonies, get some help, some backup. And the most important part of the Declaration of Independence to this day is it is this broad appeal by declaring unalienable rights, these ideas of natural rights, and that the power of government 
rest with the people. Popular sovereignty rest with the people. And you could see a lot of John Locke's influence throughout Jefferson's writing of the Declaration of Independence. And by July of 1776, the Declaration of Independence is formally adopted and we America. Now before you break out the fireworks and the hot dogs and all that other good stuff that we celebrate on the 4th of July, you have to understand that colonial unity was really questionable at best. On one side you have the Patriots and these are the colonists who fought against the British. They supported the American Revolution and the largest number of them were in the New England area around Boston but they were never a majority of the population. Anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of people in the colonies were patriots. On the other side were the loyalists and these were of course colonists loyal to the British. They were opposed to independence Numbers vary, but anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of people were loyalists. They were called Tories over in England, and they tended to be educated, wealthy, older, more conservative, people who were connected to the monarchy, or members of the Anglican clergy. They are going to have a hard time because they are going to be on the losing side. They're treated as traitors during and after the American Revolution. Their property was very often seized, and they were harassed, and a lot of them are going to leave the United States uh, during and after the war is over. And it's important to note there's also a third group, which are those people who were neutral or apathetic. They didn't really care. You know, they were more loyal to their colony or their state, their region. They just wanted to be on their farm. So they weren't really committed to the American independence cause. And this is anywhere between about a third of the people in the colonies. It's important you also know that this battle between England versus America, both sides were coming in with certain strengths and weaknesses. On England's side, Great Britain was militarily and economically superior to the colonies. They had the best army, they had a very, very developed manufacturing sector, so they were able to provide supplies, whereas the colonists were poorly trained, poorly supplied, and so on. As we mentioned, there was considerable loyalist opposition in the colonies, so not all the colonists supported the cause. That's going to be a strength for England and a weakness for the colonies. And of course, a big colonial weakness we'll break down next video is there was a weak government structure under the Continental Congress and eventually the first national government, the Articles of Confederation. You know, the government couldn't really get the economy going. They printed paper money, which was worthless. So colonies are going to have a rough time. In spite of this rough time, the colonies are going to have certain strengths. They had, of course, greater familiarity with the land. They're fighting on their home turf. They had home field advantage. They're fighting a defensive war, meaning all they have to do is not lose and they would win the war. And they're going to use tactics such as guerrilla warfare where they're going to kind of attack when appropriate and engage in battles that are favorable to them. They're going to have resilient military and political leadership. They're fighting for a cause that they believe in. And you're going to see great leaders like George Washington, especially as he rallies the troops at Valley Forge during a low moment in the war. And it's important to not underestimate the ideological commitment. They're fighting, once again, for a purpose, whereas England's fighting to keep colonies that don't want to be with them. It doesn't really have as much passion attached to it. And another big strength for the colonies is the eventual support from European allies, especially France, following the Battle of Saratoga. Make sure you know that. Which leads us to our next point, why did France help out the colonists? One factor was France hoped to regain its power in North America and Europe, and if you recall, they suffered a bad defeat in the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, where they lost all their territory in North America, so they want some payback against England. But there's other reasons for France to support the colonists. If England is removed from the 13 colonies, this would mean an end of British mercantile policies like the Navigation Acts that said the colonies could only trade certain goods to England, and therefore France would be able to freely trade with the colonies. So there was an economic motive. And some elements of French society were caught up in the idealism and the Enlightenment ideas. They want to support this revolutionary movement. Ben Franklin goes over to France, you can see him getting his bald head tickled there in that painting, to help negotiate the treaty. And France was actually giving the colonists secret aid prior to 1778, but nothing formal, no formal alliance until following 
the Battle of Saratoga. Once the colonists win that battle in 1778, France and America sign a treaty, and this provides the colonists with money, weapons, naval support, which is hugely important, because now they can have a navy on their side, and soldiers. And really key to the American victory is going to be French assistance. There are a lot of battles of the American Revolution. You don't need to be experts on them, but a quick rundown of some of the key ones. Lexington conquered, opening shots, Bunker Hill, they technically lose, the colonists lose, but it kind of is a morale boost. Hey, perhaps we can actually hold our own. It's important to understand from 1775 to 1777, things are bad for the Patriot cause. The British are occupying New York, they're occupying Philadelphia, things aren't going too swell. You do get another victory where Washington famously crosses the Delaware River and captures the German mercenary troops at the Battle of Trenton, followed up a week later by the Battle of Princeton, another morale boost, hey, we're getting a win, that's always key. Battle of Saratoga, the British surrender to the Americans, and this brings in French assistance. France joins the war on the side of the Americans. You might want to know that following this period, later on, England focused their war effort on the southern colonies, and the reason for that is there's a lot of loyalists in that region, and there's a high slave population, so therefore they're hoping that would work to their advantage, perhaps cause tension within the colonies and disrupt their ability to fight the war. And make sure you know about the Battle of Yorktown, which is the final major battle in October of 1781, when General Cornwallis surrenders to the Americans and the French troops. The French military plays a key role at Yorktown. They blockaded the sea. You can see that on the map. And George Washington gets the victory along with his French homies, which leads us to the Treaty of Paris of 1783. And the Treaty of Paris is negotiated by Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay. They headed to Paris to negotiate an end to the war. They never finished that painting. Fun story right there. And the Treaty of Paris, when it is all said and done and signed, it does a couple of things. One, England recognized the United States independence. We are free. The boundary of the U.S. would extend to the Mississippi River. You could see our before and after. Um, we would go all the way up to the Great Lakes, so England's still going to control Canada, and Spain will control Florida and the territory west of the Mississippi River. The Americans do agree to do some things. They must respect the rights of the loyalists, so property rights and things like that. Debt should be repaid to not only the loyalists, but also to British creditors. And following the war, there will be some conflicts in these different areas. A question you oftentimes see on the AP exam is the impacts of the American Revolution. So important to know why it started and then what are the outcomes. And one of the big impacts is going to be greater political democracy in the new state and national governments. You know, many state constitutions abolished many old European laws and traditions. And one example of this can be seen the restrictions on allowing titles of nobility to be granted in many state constitutions. There's different ideas of what republicanism would mean, how much or how democratic would this new nation be. There was increases in democracy, but there were limits to it. Many states eliminated property requirements from voting. Um, so, for example, the big one is Pennsylvania. They had a unicameral legislator where most white men could vote and there was no governor, but not all states did this. In spite of this democratization, it's important to note the colonial elite remained and other states restricted political involvement, meaning you had to own property in order to be eligible to vote. Most states did not have full democracy. It was not extended to African Americans, women, Native Americans, unfortunately. And so one of the things you're going to see throughout American hi history is this movement towards greater democratic participation. The American Revolution inspired revolutions in France, Haiti, and in Latin America, and you're going to see revolutions take place, and very often they're going to be inspired by the words found in the Declaration of Independence. Social impacts of the American Revolution, you're really going to see this in the realm of women. They play a significant role. They maintained farms and businesses while the men were away 
fighting the war. Many women served as nurses and cooks following the Continental Army around. And even before the war, we saw the importance of women in the economic boycotts with the Daughters of Liberty, with the spinning bees. There's even one Massachusetts woman who dressed in men's clothing and served in the Army for 17 months. Now, as a result of these contributions, women began to demand greater rights. One important figure is Abigail Adams, wifey of John Adams. She reminded her husband to remember the ladies and she called for greater rights for women. As a result of women's experiences in the movement for independence and the formation of a new republic, there was this ideal of Republican motherhood which called on women to teach Republican values within the family. So women played a very important role in the new republic of raising the children of the home to be good citizens in this new nation. In spite of some of these changes, it's important to note women were still treated as second-class citizens. Women were not able to vote, married women could not own property or sign contracts, and there were numerous restrictions on the rights of women. During the war, Native Americans oftentimes fought on the side of the British, and the big reason for this is the British limited colonial settlement. Remember the Proclamation Line of 1763, you could see on the map, had restricted the movement of white settlers into Native American land, so many Native Americans sided with the British. So when the war was over, this was a huge defeat for Native Americans because now white settlers were unchecked into Native American land. Siding with the British wasn't always the case. For example, the Iroquois Confederation was divided over the issue. They tried to stay neutral in the beginning of the war, and then some tribes fought for the colonists, and many others fought for the British. But for Native Americans, it's important to keep in mind their land is now opened up to the United States all the way to the Mississippi River. The American Revolution had a lot of impacts on the African American community. African Americans eventually were allowed to fight in the Continental Army and there were many African Americans who fought for the revolutionary cause, but there were also African Americans who fought for the British. The British Royal Governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, promised freedom to any slave who fought for the British against the colonists. Unfortunately for those individuals, the British lose, so that freedom was not granted. Following the American Revolution, there was gradual emancipation in the northern and middle states. You know, for many, there was a growing awareness of inequalities in societies, the hypocrisy of all men are created equal, and the fact that slavery was not economically profitable in those regions. All of those things lead to states in the north and the middle granting emancipation. You could see this on the map, the years emancipation takes place, and really famously with the Pennsylvania Gradual Emancipation Law of 1780. This law said no more slaves could come into the state, and children born to slave parents would be considered free. So you're going to get the gradual disappearance of slavery in the North and the South. In spite of slavery slowly kind of dying out in the middle states and the northern states, later on slavery will expand in the South and in the adjacent western lands. And what's going to happen is you're going to get distinct regional identities develop between the North and the South. One slave, one free. This will of course create distinct regional attitudes towards slavery. Each area, the North and the South and the West, will have distinct regional identities and this will ultimately lead into problems later on. And as we will see in our next video, slavery will be protected in the Constitution. So even though it will end in some places, it will very much be a part of the fabric of American life. That's going to do it for today. Hopefully you learned a whole lot. And if you did, click like on the video. Tell your friends about the channel. And if you have any questions, post them in the comment section. Until next time, have a beautiful day. Peace.